everyone. This is Sudeshna from the Abundant Psyche and you are listening to the Not So Corporate podcast. Here we talk about all of the not so corporate things we corporate entrepreneurs do within and outside our corporate lives. And today I have with me a fabulous guest, Maureen Van Shura. After a decade of practicing law and experiencing chronic health conditions over the years, Maureen left the corporate world and the rat race along with it for the pursuit of a more rewarding, a free and a more purposeful life. She sold her house and 99% of her belongings and moved abroad. She started her business to help other entrepreneurs to easily protect their businesses without the high cost and hassle of hiring an attorney, DIY contracts, templates, and other legal resources that could be required for their businesses. Welcome to the show, Maureen. I'm so glad to have you. Hi, Maureen. So good to see you. You too. Thank you for having me on. I'm so excited to be here. So, so excited to have you because you have quite an interesting journey in terms of doing that super ambitious law degree, becoming a lawyer, spending a decade in law, and then you sold 99% of your belongings, you quit law or working in the big corporate law firms. And moved continents, traveled around. You have a fascinating story. So so tell me, why did you get into law? And then what made you leave the corporate world? Well, thank you for the fascinating part. You know, it's kind of funny. My brother would say that this was mockingly. He, he just kept calling it my eat, pray, love, my version of eat, pray, love. And I was like, you know, it's a little bit more than that. But um, so how did I get into law in the first place? In the U.S., you pretty much have to decide your college major from your freshman or sophomore year of college. And, you know, honestly, who knows what they want to do for the rest of their lives when they're 18. And for me, I went into college pre-med. I thought I wanted to be a doctor. And then I got to organic chemistry and realized "Mm, probably not the best fit. Um, And I'd always been good at persuasive writing and persuasive speaking. And so law seemed to be a logical fit for somebody who liked English history. And I was a political science major. And honestly, if you're a political science major, your options career-wise are law or being a political science professor. So I went the law route. You know, I thought at the time, I thought I wanted to be a prosecutor. I thought I was very black and white in my thinking when I was, you know, 18 or 19. And I thought, you know, put the bad guys in jail. That was going to be my goal. That was my life's purpose. And, you know, it's amazing how things have monumentally shifted from my thinking when I was 18 or 19. I actually um, would love to touch upon both of those things. You mentioned that as an 18, 19 year old, you think of life in black or white and how it's shifted on the bad guys do they go to the jail? What happened? How did your thinking evolve? Well, I think that my comp- my thinking was so compartmentalized. Like I knew that, okay, so, and, and most of your listeners can relate, you know, we're intelligent, driven, successful individuals. And I was smart and driven in college. And so I knew that I wanted to do well financially. And so to me, law just seemed logical. This is a way to make a good income, have a successful life. So my my thinking was really kind of siloed in that respect, if that makes sense. Like I didn't realize how many other options there were for people who wanted to think out of the box. And I mean, even then I was unconventional. Like I studied abroad and I graduated college early and I lived abroad for a year, but I still kind of was like my, like my, like I said, my my thinking was was pretty siloed, and it's amazing. Like the more life experiences you have, and the more things that you explore. Like I've I tried so many different things in law, trying to find something that really felt right, um, that really resonated, and you know, so it's been an interesting journey. But that really influenced my thinking too, and realizing that okay, there's so many different ways to look at life and 
careers and, and not everything has to be, okay, this is a decision you make and this is your course for the rest of your life. That is so true. I spoke to Sarah from the former lawyer and she basically mentioned exactly those things that she was good at writing, therefore took up law and thought would go into prosecution, but then realized that she is not very comfortable and okay with conflict. So what I'm hearing is actually even within law, there are several options that you can take and you chose the corporate career route first. Why did you give that up? I actually um, tried multiple different areas of law. So I tried family law for a bit. Talk about soul destroying. I did one thing I did like was consulting because that was an involving a lot of legal research and I love to research. Um, but consulting for a legal company um, on our clients were the federal government. Um, so that was interesting. I did a little bit of intellectual property law, a lot of business law, just trying to get again to find the right fit. Um, and then I did insurance defense law for a few years. So to answer your question, a couple reasons why I left. It was miserable. I hated the billable hour. I hated that I felt like we were capped as far as income. It just, it, the whole law model to me is so antiquated. And I know that this will probably resonate with a lot of your listeners as well. It's like, it's not designed for people to work smarter because you're disincentivized to work more efficiently. Because with a billable hour, it's all about how much you work is how much you get paid. And to me, that never felt right, especially when I was helping small business owners to protect their businesses. It's like, well, how, how is that fair to just continue to work slower than I really could? Because that's the way the firm would make more money. Yeah, this is a debate we have had so many times, even within consulting, because you're right, like the billable hours, the more you can bill, the more profitable the project becomes, the more revenue generating the prof uh, project becomes. But I don't really know if the end client is always best served because of that, because you're not increasing productivity, you are not increasing profitability. You are there helping the client, yeah, but also sometimes you not being there is more helpful, I feel. I am quite a proponent of empowering people rather than doing it for them. So love what you are doing with Solvent Legal as well. So do you want to tell us a bit of your journey on how did you quit the corporate world? What was difficult for you to do? What were the things that you were thinking about? Or, I mean, I'm sure you did not make a decision to sell off everything and move abroad overnight. Or did you? I don't know. Tell me more. No, it was, um, you know, it's funny. It was, it was something that was kind of germinating in the back of my mind for a while. But then once I made the decision, it was like, boom, boom, boom. And I, you know, sold my house, sold everything, moved abroad within, I think, three or four months. But it's interesting. So the genesis for all of this was really started probably in June of 2019. And I had a moment, it sounds probably so melodramatic, but I was actually in Cuba um, on holiday and I was sunburnt to an absolute crisp and I was so miserable and I was just sitting there like, you know what, I have a good life on the surface. I have a good job, good income, good house, good friends, but I just felt like I was mired in mediocrity. Again, completely melodramatic. I realize this right now. But at the time, it felt like this watershed moment for me and I, and I realized I was like, I want to up-level every aspect of my life. I don't feel fulfilled. I'm not living my purpose. I didn't know what my purpose was at the time, but I knew I wasn't living it. And so it was like this low level depression because I just felt like I there was so much, I was meant for a bigger life. And then also a big part of it too was I had chronic health issues, which weren't getting be any better. And they were just continuing to get worse regardless of what I did. Like um, your listeners can't see me right now, but I have a wig on. Like I had um, profound hair loss 
and completely unexplained. I went to doctor after doctor, tried supplement after supplement, diet after diet, and I started meditating and going to hypnotherapy and acupuncture, the list of things that I tried as long and distinguished, but I just wasn't getting any better. So I had that moment in Cuba and it was like, you know what, there's something much, much deeper here that I need to address. And so that's when I started looking and I was mercenary. I looked at every aspect of my life and I was like, okay, what's working and what's not working. And then I tried as best as I could to eliminate wasn't what wasn't working. And I knew that I wanted to start my own business. So one of the first steps was quitting my law firm job. And when I quit, I had no idea what I was going to do. I knew it was going to be something law related, but hadn't figured it out. And then as far as the house and the belongings, once I was location independent, I, I was in Charleston, South Carolina at the time, which is lovely. But I'd been there for four or five years and was just kind of, it wasn't challenging to me anymore. I didn't feel like I was growing as a person. So I was like, well, I don't, I don't need to be here. There's nothing keeping me here. So let's sell the house. And then, um, then it was kind of a domino effect. It was like, well, I want to move abroad. I've always loved living abroad. So let's move abroad. And honestly, I don't need a three bedroom house worth of furniture and, you know, this fancy schmancy wardrobe, because I'm certainly not going to black tie events anymore. So, you know, sell or donate all of that. And then, you know, like I said, it was just kind of things, boom, boom, boom. In retrospect, probably not the best time to do it because my house, the closing on my house was March 31st, 2020. So exactly when COVID was really starting to hit the U.S. So, um, and I'd actually decided to move to Australia. I was going to end up in Australia and, you know, Australia's borders are still closed. So it's been, it's been an interesting journey. I bet. I mean, I can't even imagine the courage that it takes to actually look through every aspect of your life. So when you were looking through all of these different bits of life, Maureen. I know that um, we have spoken before. I know we are interested in a couple of common things, which are biochemistry, neuroscience, meditation, all of those good things. When you were going through this phase of health issues, etc., I don't want to lead you to an answer, but what was wrong and what helped you get back on track with all of those? That's such a great question. And the answer is it's it's still in progress. Like I still have not gotten, at least from conventional Western medicine, a diagnosis for my hair loss. So it was, and this is also to the way I'm wired that if there's a problem, I'm going to do everything in my power to solve it. So through my own research and trial and error and biohacking, I've been able to see improvements. I realized it was a combination of factors. And I actually am in the process of creating a website for women with hair loss, just because in the process of doing all this research, I accumulated so much knowledge. I spent over, you know, 40 or $50,000 US on testing and doctors and supplements. So I would say that I think it's a combination of things and stress is one of the biggest. And, you know, it took a while for me to accept that because I grew up always thinking that when people said that they were stressed or it was a cop out, it was almost like you are weak if you admitted that you were stressed and, and, busy was a badge of honor. So to say that you're stressed and use, it felt like an excuse. So it took a lot of deep work for me to realize that, okay, stress is at the root of so many medical issues that, you know, worldwide we're experiencing. And to just say, oh, you need to get stronger and like wise up, you know what? Like that's, that's so detrimental. So I I really had to accept that um, I played a role in all of this, like a huge, like, and and not doing a better job of managing my stress. And like, for me, 
at the time, managing my stress was going out for a hard five mile run. I thought that was me managing my stress well. It, I had to do a lot of work and say, okay, well, actually that's maybe is the worst thing for me right now. Maybe I need to go out for a short 30 minute walk in nature and not abuse my body. So to answer your question, I keep going down these rabbit holes, but it's a work in progress. I've tried so many different things. I really dove into spirituality and that's been a huge piece of all of this. So it's almost like I had to address the physical and which is still a work in progress, but the mental even so much more than the physical because everything starts with the mental aspect. That is so true. Like I think in our culture, actually across the world, in our cultures, we have started to look at physical and identify with our physical bodies, etc. Which is, which is, of course, there, right? That's, that's there. But sometimes I feel, and spirituality sort of tells me that you are actually built from the inside out, not the outside in. And whatever you do to change your body, unless you change the inside, it's not going to go away. How did spirituality help you in all of this? Were you spiritual to begin with? So um, that has been an evolution that I never expected. Um, entrepreneurship, you know, it's, it's absolutely brilliant, but it also forces you, at least for me, it's almost like a razor blade, like ripping open your, your soul and you have to address every single limiting belief, every single trauma that you didn't even realize you had. You have to address it if you ever want to progress in your business. So that was part of my journey into exploring my spirituality. I was raised Catholic. I tried to, and I don't mean to disparage Catholicism, but there's a lot of indoctrination that goes on at least with, I went, I went to Catholic school for high school, college, and law school. And I love the spiritual aspect of it, but the organized religion part of it never kind of felt right with me. So in 2018, I think I had a ton of stress, a ton of emotional stress. I'd had multiple surgeries on my ankle, on my foot. I was bitten by a poisonous spider and almost lost my toe. It was the most absurd year. It was just thing after thing after thing. And looking back on it, I almost feel like it was God, the universe, whatever you believe in being like, okay, Marin, like you need to address this. You can't, you know, go out on a, a long run and ignore your problems. You need to face all this. So I started actually with Reiki, I think in the summer of 2018. And that just felt like I'm a rational type A pragmatic lawyer. And I thought that that was so woo woo. And I was like, this is, this is like a, a prayer circle where everybody's going to sing Kumbaya and they're in dreadlocks. And, you know, it's, it just felt so far from any frame of reference I had, but it's like, you know what, the Reiki practitioner came highly recommended. And that first session, it was like, she peered into my soul and I was hooked. And so I saw her weekly for two years, I think. And that was kind of the catalyst for a lot of the spiritual development. I did kind of like the neuroscience part of spirituality. I saw a great hypnotherapist and that felt like the science part of spirituality, if that makes sense, because it was almost like so we were addressing the limiting beliefs. We were tackling the subconscious. But at the same time, from a spiritual angle, it felt like it unlocked this intuitive channel for me. So we were addressing things that needed to be addressed, but I was also getting more in touch with myself and my ability to make my own decisions. And then, I mean, I'm trying to think of some of the other things I did. I did theta healing. That was interesting. I did, oh, one of the most interesting things that was actually profoundly life-changing for me, which like when you were saying all the woo-woo, like you never thought that you would be woo. Okay. I hired a femininity coach, like um, a feminine energy coach and coming from such a masculine energy dominated profession like law, it, it's just, it's like night and day, but 
you know, exploring everything as an entrepreneur and the limiting beliefs and realizing that like, okay, I have huge aspirations for my business, but my thinking that got me where I am with my current problems is not going to get me to where I want to be, you know, that, that, that level. So I need to, I got the strategy. I need to look at the energetics And I realized that my feminine energy, um, I was just, you know, masculine energy driven, like strategy, process, do, 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 do. So yeah, I worked with her for months and that was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. So I could go on and on, but I've tried so many things from the spiritual perspective and it's been, it's been profound. For me absolutely this is the second time in a month that the feminine energy versus the masculine energy has come up and i think in corporate we do deal with a lot of that very focused very rational way of thinking and i was saying this you know a couple of podcasts back when we were talking about this is that in the corporate world we want more women in leadership but to what end if we want more women in leadership, we want more of that feminine energy in leadership, not for women to become men. And somehow we have a structure out in the, well, I don't want to say every company out there is like that, but most of the corporate world is mostly men, mostly men in leadership, very, very focused on the logic. And I, I, I I think logic is great, as you would probably also say, there has to be a balance of both. The problem arises when that balance isn't there. And I think in some regards, the corporate world is probably suffering the lack of a feminine energy as well. But moving on to the woo-woo versus the lawyer, Marie, how the, how has your lawyer self taken on all of this? What does your lawyer brain say about it? You know, the lawyer brain struggles, especially I, I'm kind of in the middle of some big changes with my business, my business in a, in a good way. We are um, leveling up. And as I'm sure some of your listeners can relate, anytime you level up, there's that feeling in your stomach, like you know it's what you want to do and you can see your next level self. Sometimes it's very far in the distance, but it's not all sunshine and rainbows and unicorns and roses. So that's kind of where I am now. But I'm also realizing, so my default is still that lawyer brain, have to figure everything out. What's the strategy? How is this going to work? And I also, it's, it's you know, my brain, sometimes it's like a war up there between that side trying to dominate. And then the other side being like, you know what, let's just see kind of, let's be open to things unfolding in maybe a different way than you ever expected. And being open. And like, I literally had to say to myself, I am open to any opportunity, however it comes to me. That has been such a game changer for me in my business because there were certain things that I said that I didn't want to do. And I was so like hard line about it. Like I did not want to do this aspect of law. I did not want to do custom work. I did not want to do this. And then when I started being like, well, okay, well maybe I do this temporarily. It's been amazing to see the different types of opportunities just kind of fall into my lap just by being more open to, okay, Marin, maybe it's all going to happen, but it doesn't necessarily have to happen exactly how I thought it would on my timeline. So there's still that part of my brain that has trouble with relinquishing control. But I think also, and I'm going to say God, because through this spiritual journey, I mean, it's been, it's been interesting because it's been, I've tried so many things that have brought me back to God, but it's been, I feel like I'm placed in this situation now where I have no control over being able to move back abroad. Like I had the plan, I was going to move in July and I was going to move to Ireland and I was going to do this, this, and this. And so many different variables in my life have popped up that have made that very challenging. 
And so I'm choosing now it's a work in progress. And this is where I'm trying to cultivate that feminine energy and say, okay, well, I don't know how this is going to work out. I, my brain wants to control the situation and say, okay, this is, this is the plan. This is what's going to happen, but I need to be open for something that maybe is even more magical than what I had planned happening. And so that's kind of, to answer your question, I would just say the lawyer brain tries to dominate, but the more I work on being open to receiving, surrendering and relinquishing control, the more I feel at peace. And that's one of the biggest things too with the spiritual journey is that I'm a much calmer human being. That low level anxiety that I had when I was practicing law, it's still there to a degree. I mean, every business owner, especially I, we just hit the one year mark. There's going to be some anxiety, but just overall, I would say um, I'm just like a much calmer, peaceful individual. I hear you. And that's really the magic word there that the moment you surrender and stop trying to control everything, somehow magically the universe responds. It's very interesting. It's happened to me. Just can't explain so many times why that's been the case but it's been so yeah those are the magic words but yeah i i mean very much like you i work in data and where strategy and all of those things again very very rational and logical i have a hard time giving up control at times as well at times most of the time if, I, if i'm honest but i definitely completely hear you in that that whenever I try doing that is when I have found more peace, more calm, more energy, actually. So uh, moving on to what you are doing now, Maureen, tell us a bit more what sort of work you do with your clients. I created, because we, we talked about this, about the billable hour um, at the beginning and how I hated that. I wanted to create a cost-effective way for business owners, online business owners to protect their businesses. And originally it was just solopreneurs. Um, even the name Soliviant Legal, like um, in retrospect, choosing a business name that nobody knows what it means is probably not the best idea, but Soliviant means, um, you know, it's basically like traveling alone, reveling in solo travel and adventure. And so I always thought like, to me, entrepreneurship was like a solo trip, uncharted territory, without a GPS, without directions. So that's kind of like, it's travel's a big part of my brand. But anyway, I wanted a cost-effective way for business owners to protect their businesses as quickly and painlessly as possible. Legal, I know, can be so overwhelming. And I see this time in, it's time in and time out with um, business owners that they haven't done anything as far as contracts or just basic protections for their business because they were scared. So they put their head in the sand and then they've had all kinds of issues. So I create customizable DIY contract templates. So the goal with the business is to be a one-stop shop where let's say a brand new coach needs, with a, she's setting up a website, she's setting up her business. She needs to know how to set up her business legally. She needs contracts for her clients. She needs her website protected. I wanted to be that one-stop shop and do it in a way that was painless and quick and hassle-free. So the customizable templates, people can download those and then, you know, get their businesses protected in under an hour. And then I kind of branched off and did some courses I'm doing some workshops and next week I'm launching my trademark services. So then I can really be a one-stop shop where somebody can start to finish, they can start their brand and then they can comprehensively protect their brand. That is so cool. You were probably one of the first people who came in my radar and said, hey, you do need to do this. Don't forget about it. So thanks a lot to you about that. So tell me, is it only solopreneurs that you work with right now? Are they smaller businesses? Is there a reason you focus on solopreneurs and smaller businesses versus the slightly bigger ones? No, solopreneurs, it was just because when I started, I was a solopreneur. And so there was kind of that like unspoken bond with other solopreneurs. But now it's, it's pretty much online businesses of varying sizes, usually 
for the most part, as far as people that come to me just needing one contract, it's smaller businesses, solopreneurs, or maybe they have a couple employees, but I also wanted it to be, I don't work with larger companies. They also have sometimes unique needs that me as a location independent lawyer can't um, cover because they, I don't know, I'm trying to think of an example, like, I don't know, maybe they need some sort of joint venture agreement or purchasing agreement or something like that's, I could do it, but I wanted my wheelhouse to be very narrowly tailored to serve the solopreneur or the small business owner um, as best as possible versus trying to be, you know, really diverse and, you know, serve large businesses, small businesses. Um, so, yeah, small business, small business owners who are online is my bread and butter. Got it. You mentioned location independence. How does that matter and why is that important? From a personal standpoint, it allowed me to move abroad, which is huge from the freedom aspect. Professionally, it's so contracts. I have clients from all over the world. I probably have almost as many non-US clients. And when I say clients, I mean people purchasing my, my contracts or courses or whatever that are outside of the US than in the US, which is amazing to me to have like you know, this little, very, very tiny global business. So the, and that's why I specialize in what I do, because if I tried to broaden the scope and say, offer employment agreements, that is very specific to a country and also to states within a country, like in the US, for example, different states have different employment laws. So I didn't even want to go there. You know, I wanted to provide what I can provide to business owners across the world. Got it. Got it. Okay. So that's, that's actually really cool that I wouldn't have thought about it that way that it's actually not probably something that most law firms also even deal with. They are not dealing with location independent um, laws and contracts. I don't know. I no, don't know much you're, about you're, you're right. Law. It's a good point. Usually law firms are dealing with um, local clients in, in their town, in their state. But the nature of online businesses, I just worked with a business owner last week who is based, she's an Australian, based in New Zealand, who is serving clients all over the world. So you need to have contracts that reflect, you know, universal contract principles, I guess I should say. So online business is very, is very unique in that respect. It's not specific to any one location, really. Super cool. So uh, if we talk about one year from now, Marine, what are you most excited about? Wow, that's a great question that I haven't really thought about. I would say excited about the fact that I've created this well-oiled machine, um, meaning I finally have all my systems in place. I have a, a website that's representative of the, you know, the the high quality stellar brand that I want to be. And I have, you know, um, I have a couple of virtual assistants now, but maybe I have, you know, other people doing marketing and ads and things for me. So then I am so laser focused on what I love doing, which is creating unique content, and then just having the ability, like last week, I randomly had an idea for a workshop, being able to have the, the time to just say, okay, I'm going to do this next week versus being mired in a lot of just the working in my business versus on my business. And in a year, I will have structured everything so that I am as passive as possible and, you know, working three, three days a week, and then traveling the rest of the time. That feels really aligned and free to me. That's, that's very cool because, you know, people don't realize, I think in the first year of their business as well, I, I, I shouldn't say people don't, many people don't realize that in the first year of their businesses, they don't even realize that you can set it up as a scalable offer. You should put the systems in place before rather than figuring out all of it. And then second year you start putting in the systems. So it's really, really cool that you have done all of that. That is in my 
opinion, my economist and strategist brain agrees to all of it. In fact, like the last week itself, I was doing a podcast on exactly the same topic. Um, but we have spoken a lot about a lot of not so corporate things on this podcast. If you had to choose one as a piece of advice to the listeners, what would you tell them? And this is me being a lawyer and being unable to be brief and choose just one thing. I guess I would say to really think about what you're passionate about. Um, And it can be, I was told once that people, when they're looking for their purpose, they they can have trouble because they're looking for that thing that they love. Like they can't wait to get out of bed in the morning. But somebody told me to look at it paradoxically and be like, well, what, what is it something that you hate that makes you angry? Because that can be your purpose as well. So I would say, um, you know, figure out what you're passionate about, whether it's something you love or something you hate that makes you angry and go at it full force. Be relentless in figuring out how you can live that purpose and as much as possible, tune out the noise because as you really start to live your best life, you're going to get a lot of people objecting to how you're living your life. People aren't going to understand. People are going to be triggered. Everybody has an opinion. And I just, I always say, you know, stay in your own lane. So that's probably like five pieces of advice, but I would say identify your passion Go after it relentlessly because at the end of the day, that's what's going to make you happy and and feel fulfilled, at least in my opinion. And then stay in your own lane and tune out the noise because you can never make everybody happy. And at the end of the day, the person that you need to make happy is yourself. That sounded really cliche. Sounds cliche because it's true. This has been so great, Maureen. It's been so lovely to have you on. For all of you who've been listening If you are interested, I'll leave down the links uh, to get in touch with Maureen uh, in the box below. And if you have any comments, questions, drop them wherever you are listening or shoot me an email on station at theabundancepsyche.com. And I'll see you the next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you.